pretty sweet. Um, for those of you who didn't hear, my name is Jason Miller, and I practice in Ashland, Oregon. Um, I'm a licensed acupuncturist there and have my master's in Chinese medicine. I'm also uh, an herbalist and a nutritionist and an applied kinesiologist, so I bring lots of different um, tools and skills to the table when I work with people. Um, my focus is in um, the management of chronic disease, especially cancer, and I really got dropped into cancer care through my work with Donald Yance um, in Ashland. I can, I, or I could get closer to the mic, is that better? You know, I'm used to these little labs, I clip them on and then you can just walk around. Um, I won't be doing much moving, I guess, from here. What I'm gonna try and do um, is talk at a glacial pace, because otherwise I'm, I'll talk really fast, it's just sort of, I don't know, it's been that way since I can remember. So I was saying that my work with Donald Yance um, and Dwight McKee and Jonathan Treasure in Ashland, um, Chanchel Cabrera, a group of really uh, great world-renowned herbalists who all have devoted their lives to the study of cancer and how we can improve cancer therapies. Uh, I included Dr. Dwight McKee in that list, who, um, although not in, an herbalist by trade, um, he's a hematologist oncologist who's been practicing um, in this country and in Mexico and other other countries doing all kinds of different therapies for cancer. He's been investigating and treating and helping and consulting in this field for 45 years now and he's one of my greatest mentors and so um, unfortunately he's not taking more patients to anymore. He's put in his time in that realm and but he is helping others help people. Um, and so I just brought him up because he's been mentioned a couple times today and I was having breakfast with him yesterday morning talking about some of these topics that are up. And so uh, a lot of great resources that kind of brought me into the field of cancer. And so now the last seven years I've just been uh, devoting my life to it, it daily. So that's a little bit about me. And my talk, um, I wasn't sure what the title was going to be. It, it one In one place it said, healing with herbal medicine, which I thought, wow, that's pretty broad and pretty general. I guess I could go anywhere. And the other one said um, botanicals in cancer care. And I think that one's a little bit more accurate for what uh, I'm looking at doing today. Interesting to me that in this the setting, um, it's different than a lot of the conferences I've been speaking at in the last few years where there have been primarily um, doctors and other practitioners who I've been speaking to and kind of giving information, trying to, to help others, you know, gather more, more practical information, how they can help um, their patients. In this case, just from my conversations with people in the hallway, um, the people that I've heard speaking, there's a lot more actual, you know, patients here, people who are actually going through the process of having cancer, treating their own cancer, or being very closely, intimately involved with cancer which um, is it's good for me to realize, and it's just been really powerful already, the interactions I've had. Everything from just walking down the hallway and just mentioning to someone, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Oh, how do you like the conference? Oh, it's good, I'm, I'm helping out here. Oh, that's great, you know, what do you, wh what's your involvement? Oh, well, my wife had cancer two years ago and I wanna do anything I can, so I'm gonna volunteer here, you know, and just really powerful and moving place to be, and so it's a really a great honor to be here. Um, Thank you all. So I'm going to start with the idea of uh, botanical medicine. What's that? It's a question? No? Botanical medicine in cancer. Um, and going, taking it back to the roots of botanical medicine and this idea of coevolution. You know, we talk a lot today about genetics, genomics, and you know, the deeper we can look at our DNA as a source of information for us to understand how different plants, different compounds, things might affect us. And if we go way back into the roots of human and basically animal uh, coevolution with plants, we find that there's a lot of fascinating relationships that are there. And I remember arguing with my history of medicine teacher my first quarter uh, of, of medical study about whether if an animal chooses a plant as a medicine, so to say, is it considered medical? Is it herbal medicine? And his point was that no, it's not because it's not actually part of a system of medicine. And I said, well, to me it is. And it's because, you know, to me, anything that someone does that 
does something beneficial for their body is medicine. And so the, the argument was a good one. I ended up getting a good grade on the paper after we had a long discussion, but it's great to get into. And so some of the co-evolutionary relationships that have shown up are things like, you know, monarch butterflies finding the, the milk vetch where there's a compound there that kills off the fungus that inhabits the butterfly and destroys its wings and inhibits its ability to fly. To me, that's a beautiful example of animals using herbal medicine. Um, there's, there's lots of other examples. You see your dog or your cat go to the backyard when it's having a, you know, an issue with nausea or vomiting something and going out into the backyard and eating grass and then inducing more vomiting to get, uh, get a toxin out. That's another example. So our relationship to plants goes really deep into our DNA. And I think that's something that we want to keep at the forefront of you know, our approach to using plants and not thinking them as something completely foreign, as in when we look at, um, you know, a chemical compound that we've created and now that we're studying, we're going to try to understand it. And one of the things I want to flush out in this talk is just kind of, you know, what's, what can we do with botanical medicine? What's its importance in, the, in, a, in its role in cancer today? And really, how can we create an environment that embraces the plants in the modern context of biomedicine. And so we'll get into that a little bit. One of the things I, I put on the slide here, this is cordyceps, which you might be familiar with, cordyceps sinensis. And cordyceps is really, um, it's considered a fungus primarily, but in Chinese medicine, it's called dong chong sha cao, which means summer herb and winter worm. And that's because there is a caterpillar that becomes the host for a fungus that grows out of its retina. And the relationship of those two creatures together creates this environment that creates this fungal growth called the cordyceps uh, fungus. And that is a, w a powerful medicine for us. Not only lots of anti-cancer activity, but it also is uh, a really great tonic for the kidneys, for the lungs, has a lot of uses in Chinese medicine, and it's been around for a long time. It's kind of a prized herb, one that's very hard to get anymore from the wild, and it's very expensive. So in order to overcome that, people have found ways to grow what's called the mycelium, which is the, the kind of the network of the foundational material of the fungus, not the outward polyp. And they've been able to grow that on medium, like rice or other grains, and then produce active compounds. We call them polysaccharides, and they're very immune modulating. They help upregulate the immune system, help turn on triggers in the immune system that allow it to do a better job of identifying self versus non-self. So moving on from coevolution into traditional medicine, and as Helene pointed out, you can't read it that well. If I had changed the color or done something better with it, it would look better. I'll work on that. Um, but the reason I put this slide here with this path through the forest is because if we look back at the past several thousand years, there's a great history and a treasure of medicine. Unfortunately, today, within the biomedical paradigm, we have certain means and measures by which we weigh the validity of a therapy. And it's kind of, you know, the randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind clinical trial has become the gold standard for whether something works. And <clears throat> in the long dialogues I have with many oncologists who are not able to see kind of all ends of what we're doing today to help ourselves with cancer, with this disease that is the disease of our time, what we find is that most of these people take the stance that if it hasn't been proven to work and be safe in a randomized clinical trial, then we're not going to use it. Well, to me, that's really unfortunate because we have literally thousands of years of millions of doctors treating billions of patients, recording their data, refining their approaches, and making that available. We have that information. So let's start, to me, with the path through the forest. We don't need to go blindly stumbling around. We can actually follow the footsteps of the doctors and the herbalists who came before us and use that information to build upon. And if there are places of doubt, we can dig deeper and we can uncover truths using our modern methods. But to throw out all of the information we have and say that it's not valid until we prove it within the context of our modern paradigm, we're really limiting 
what we can do and the potential to use the medicines that are available to us. So traditional medicine is a way of looking at the world through a certain lens. And the lens that I look through, one of them, is called traditional Chinese medicine. It actually is the most extensive uh, gathering of writings on medicine in the world. It's, it's very elaborate, it's very thorough, but it's self-reflective. And so the principles that are used within Chinese medicine are applied to the materials, they're applied to the assessment of the person, and it's all interrelated and interreflective. So it's a little bit harder for somebody from the outside to understand what I'm talking about. You know, if I say, you know, you have a lung qi deficiency with a kidney and lung disharmony that's leading to an, you know, um, a, a qi stagnation in the chest. And then the doctor says, well, what the hell are you talking about? And d it doesn't really matter, but it gets to, it brings me to the next slide, which is the idea that we need to find a, a way to collaborate. So collaborative medicine, you know, we have words like integrative, we have words like the man who's up here speaking about his own experience with prostate cancer, I didn't get his name, the naturopath, talking about adjunctive care. And for me, what, what I'm really striving to create is a collaborative model. And the reason that collaborative is so important is because this is a multidisciplinary, or you can hear that now, a multidisciplinary approach where, um, did, did, some, did somebody do something with the sound or is that just a, a magical kind of, a sound gremlin? Okay. Um, there's not much I can do from here, but it's a little teeny. Multidisciplinary though, and where, where different doctrines can speak about a patient or about a situation, and they can share their ideas without having to Okay, are we doing okay? I don't want to lose your attention there, sorry. So, the importance of collaborative is that we preserve the sovereign aspects of the medicine that the person is, who has studied, we keep those alive. We don't lose those by integrating them into another model. It's really important. When we, this country is notorious for synthesizing and for integrating. And the thing that gets lost is the essence of what we started with. And I don't want to do that. I want to be able to keep the essence of Chinese medicine alive for me and my practice, for it's, it's a very valuable lens through which I can view a patient, I can view a situation, I can view a material. Just gonna give you a couple examples of how we correlate Chinese medicine with biomedical principles. This is something I do a lot. I, I work a lot in the field of, you know, how do we kind of communicate about a patient in using, you know, Chinese medical medicines, and then how do we talk to the oncologist or the doctor about how those are going to have a role in the integrative management of that patient, where there is, you know, there are drugs that are being applied, there's certain therapies that are being used, how do the herbs interact, and so I've spent a lot of time studying herb-drug interactions. So here's a couple examples. Um, we talk about the circulation of qi and blood. Um, you can get stagnation of qi and blood, which is down at the bottom. These two things kind of uh, mimic each other. So when you have blood stagnation, and just so you know, in Chinese medicine for thousands of years, cancer, tumors, cysts, growths, those are examples of blood stagnation, okay? And when you look at a tumor and you think about stagnant blood and what that idea means, when you're a Chinese medical doctor or you're looking from the biomedical perspective, either way, if you look at the gross material of that tumor, it's full of blood vessels because as soon as that tumor gets to be about 10 billion cells, about two millimeters, it's got to supply itself with blood because it's not going to get enough nutrients to, to run its very inefficient energy metabolism with your blood supply, with the whatever's in the tissues locally. So that's where, you know, someone was talking earlier about cannabis, I think it was Don, he was talking about inhibiting VEGF, which is vascular endothelial growth factor. It's a growth factor that induces the growth of new blood vessels in our bodies. Well, cancer 
just like we've done in our natural world, hijacks natural systems. So it becomes very clever and it overcomes whatever inhibitions it needs to by creating ways of taking on the natural system and then applying it to itself. So it grows these blood vessels. And if you look at the tumor, it's got lots of blood vessels. And the blood in there is actually what's called hypoxic. And we actually can measure hypoxia in a tumor using different markers. One of the ones that we see used a lot is called HIF1 or hypoxia inducible factor one. Because in an oxygen depleted environment, there's a need for more blood vessels, a need for more blood to bring more oxygen to the tissues. So these growth factors are released by the tumor in order to induce more VEGF and the growth of more blood vessels. Well, that's what the tumor looks like in the biomedical perspective. Well, Chinese medicine said, hey, this is a blood stagnation issue. And to me, it's just it's such a beautiful and simple overlay that make a lot of sense to me. So the herbs that we use to break blood stagnation, to remove blood stasis and promote the circulation of blood, are almost all of them have got some preliminary research at least in their ability to inhibit cancer through some different mechanisms. And part of it is oxygenating the tissues. It's like, you know, why Dwight McKee says, you know, even if your cancer patient's feeling terrible, have them, you know, exercise every day. Get oxygen to the tissues. You go back to Otto Warburg and his whole, you know, philosophy about what cancer was. It's a breakdown of the mitochondria. It's a breakdown of the way we burn fuels in the presence of oxygen. That's what we do here. We're full of tiny little furnaces everywhere. And we're efficient at doing it. But cancer is very inefficient at doing it. It produces a very small amount of energy for the same amount of fuel with tons of byproducts. Kind of like, you know, running our ships and our planes on gas, you know, very interesting. The metaphors go pretty deep with cancer. So harmonizing our organ networks, this is, you know, getting into endocrine and vasomotor effects. These are ways of making the, 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 the hormone levels in the body more appropriate so that you find that things like estrogen, the different forms of estrogen to testosterone, all these things, you kind of work on enhancing those hormones. That, that will happen if you just horm, harmonize organ networks from a Chinese medical perspective. If you find someone has a deficient organ and you tonify that organ, you can influence the hormone production. Calming the Shen, this is like spirit. We're talking a lot about PTSD. That PTSD has come up for me just, just in the last four or five days, maybe 15 times. Like just, oh, I'm getting into PSD. Oh, I've got PSD. It's really a big deal. And calming the Shen is really calming the spirit. And the spirit in Chinese medicine is housed in the blood. It lives in the heart. And by calming the Shen, we're able to help people you know, more easily deal with stressful situations, reduce anxiety. So it's another part of what we do. And so we think about stress reduction and the nervine action of chemicals. Building the qi or the wei qi, and I'm sure that there's been some mention of qi, kind of like the body's energy system. You think again back to the mitochondria, the production of energy, ATP, those kind of concepts. Well, we think of that as qi in Chinese medicine. These, these concepts, none, nothing is direct. I'm just making some correlations here that are useful. So these are just some ideas of how we can overlay lenses. And I, I always talk about something I call layering the lenses. And I do a talk called layering the lenses, which is how you take the lens of Chinese medicine that it affords, and you take the lens of biomedicine. I had the pleasure of being a, a pre-med student at University of Minnesota, and I was a very in, in, into science for a long time. Um, and then you layer those lenses, and you take the lens of applied kinesiology, and you layer that lens. And as you layer your lenses looking at the patient, does the image that you see at the end of that focusing lens, does it get more clear, or did it just get cloudy? And if it's clarifying, and everything's pointing to the same direction, then I really can see, okay, my treatment plan is going to be really well directed because I've got a great idea of what's going on here. But if I add a lens, and suddenly the image gets blurry, then I've got more homework to do. I've got to ask some more questions. I've got to dig deeper because I'm not right on. So I like having multiple lenses to look through. So I just want to clarify, there's a difference between what we call herbal medicine and what are herbal medicines, okay? The study of herbal medicine and the practice of herbal medicine is a, is a huge thing. You could study acupuncture needles and know everything about an acupuncture needle, but you're not going to become an acupuncturist that way. You know, it's just like the, the great idea. You could learn everything there is to know about the automobile, but you're never going to understand traffic jams. So you've got to think herbal medicine is a big thing, okay? When people talk about herbal medicines, they're talking about individual things like 
The next thing that's in the limelight, right? Echinacea. Take echinacea. Take St. John's wort. Take vitamin E, vitamin D. Every couple you know, months, there's a new thing that's you know, going to get in the spotlight, and we're going to see it, and everybody's going to talk about it. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to diminish what that thing really is to something simple like, oh, saw palmetto? Oh, yeah, that's for prostate cancer. Well, you know, I don't know if you know, but saw palmetto is actually an herb, and it actually has a long history of use. And it's actually a reproductive system tonic that's really beneficial for both men and women. If you apply it in the right way, it's got great benefits. But it's not just for prostate cancer. But I mean, if I say saw palmetto to a group of people, and nine out of ten of them are going to say, oh, it's for prostate cancer. So we've got to be careful with that lime lighting of herbs. That's not herbal medicine, okay? That's the modern perspective on herbal medicines. So east and west, I don't want to talk too much about this, but just that we have the idea that you know there's there's one mountain and the east eastern perspective of deep meditation the kind of the inward look the holistic perspective kind of taking the big picture is going to meet up with the microcosmic view you know where we just found the higgs boson principle right this this you know this particle that's going to be the, the god particle or whatever it is and personally i'm not that interested i feel like if we keep looking smaller or we keep looking bigger we're going to keep finding the same thing our own reflection that's what i feel so we can look anywhere we want to look and find it. And when we get to the top of the mountain, we're going to see it's the same place. <laughs> so one of the fundamental principles of, of the practice of herbal medicine is, is making a very clear constitutional energetic assessment, both of the patient and then of the material being used, the herb. Okay? And it's a very elaborate process. And you want, you know, if, if you don't know how to do that from your own tradition, if you're not trained in physio medicine or eclectic herbalism or Chinese medicine or Ayurveda, then you should refer to an expert who can do that for you. You don't want to go to the co op and the guy says, oh, yeah, you've got cholesterol problems? Sure. You know, we got something for you right here. You know, like that's, you know, Google Doctor isn't what we recommend most of the time. So this is a, a slide that I really like because. These eight principles, you know, you learn these in the beginning of your first year of studying Chinese medicine. You know, we look at this world and it's a world of duality, right? I mean, it really is. You know, we, you know, here we are, men and women. We have up and down. We have hot and cold. We have left and right. Everything's very dualistic in this world. So this, the kind of the, the founding principle of Chinese medicine is yin and yang. And yin and yang is, you know, the, the, the idea of the tai chi. You see that symbol? Everybody calls it the yin yang. Well, it's never been called the yin yang. It's actually the tai chi, which is where the, the idea of tai chi came from. And it's the interface of white and black, which is this interplay between yin and yang. And they should be in perfect balance. And they're always pulling against each other and pushing against each other. So in everything, every material, every person, there is this aspect of yin and yang. And the most simple way to describe yin and yang is to say, you know, fire is very yang compared to water, right? The north side of a mountain is very yin compared to the south side of a mountain if you're in the northern hemisphere. Because the south side is getting hit by the sun all day and the north side's really cool and damp. There's no sun over there. So there's yin and yang aspects to everything. And then it's infinitely divisible. So you can take yin and yang in one person, and then you can go into an organ system in their body and see with the yin and yang of that organ, and you can go into the aspect of that organ, the blood in that organ, and see the yin and yang of that, and you can keep on going. It's a very beautiful system, and if you really understand it, it's very powerful, it's very fundamental, and it becomes a, a guiding force in, in treatment and assessment. Hot and cold? Hot and cold, I mean, this is 50% of your diagnosis and 50% of your treatment. And I, you know, most doctors I talk to don't have any idea what I'm talking about. Do you guys know what I mean? If, if, I, if I was talking about a disease that's hot or cold, would you have any idea what I meant? You would? Maybe? No? Good. I mean, yeah, I mean, a hot person, someone who has a hot condition, let's say they have, and we can, and Chinese medicine is all these different, you know, what we call constellations of symptoms that make a pattern, a pattern differentiation. So we might see that person has liver yang rising or liver fire flaring. Those are different diagnoses, like hot diagnoses. So the person comes into you and they have hypertension. They've got a red tongue with a really bright tip. They've got a yellow coat on their tongue. Their eyes are a little bit red in the sclera. They've got a red, red cheeks, a little red face. Their ears are a little red. They're getting some ringing in their ears. That person has a hot condition. That is a yang condition. And it's also an excess condition, okay? The other person comes in 
They're thin, they're wan, they're pale, their tongue is puffy, doesn't have much color to it, there's not much coat, maybe a thin white coat. The, the person has very low energy, they're feeling fatigued, their voice is very soft, and they get chilled a lot all the time. They have cold hands and feet. That person has a cold condition. It's most likely that it's almost all deficiency, they're very deficient, and that's a yin type of condition. So the other thing we have here is internal and external. Okay, is the disease you're working with with the person is it an internal condition or is it an external condition? That's important, and it's not just is it on the skin or is it in the body. I mean, melanoma is not an external condition. You know, mel melanoma is a, you know, it's it's a systemic disease. Um, but internal and external can be something. That the difference of you know you sprained your ankle. You know, it's kind of an external disease. It's on the outside of you. It didn't start from the inside. So someone has an injury, they traumatize themselves, you know, that, that's one thing, that could be an external trauma. But if a person comes to me with shoulder pain, the first thing I'm gonna ask them is say, well, did you fall off your horse? Well, no, I don't ride a horse. Well, did you get hit by a car? Well, no. Well, did you, were you lifting something heavy? No, I just, I don't know, it just started to hurt, you know? I think, you know, you wanna put some needles in there? So, well, well where did that come from? Well, I don't know. Well, it came from inside of you. It's an internal situation. And the body is showing you that there's an internal problem because there's pain there. Pain in Chinese medicine is equated with qi and blood stagnation, okay? It's the body's indicator. Pain tells you that there's, mo there's energy that's not flowing freely through an area. And again, if you let that happen over and over for a long, long period of time, you can lead to deeper levels of blood stagnation where you can have the formation of, you know, deformed tissue, cysts, tumors, growths. Just to kind of relate a little bit of the depth of how Chinese medicine has its own interactions and toxicology, the, there's, there's, first of all, with Chinese medicine and with, with herbal medicine as a whole, there's prescribing, right? And it's not the prescriber tradition that I'm recommending, which is, oh, you have diabetes? Oh, I've got herbs for that. Oh, you've got cancer? Here's the cancer herbs. The lowest level of medicine in the kind of the ancient Taoist tradition is to take a person or a disease and say, okay, you have disease A? All right, well, I've got the herb for disease A. It's right here. That's not what we do. What we do is we say, okay, you're a person. You have a diagnosis, okay, great. Now let's find out what's going on with you. We're gonna assess your situation. We take a scholarly approach and we develop our materials that we apply to you based on our assessment of you, okay? That's appropriate prescription based on the pattern differentiation. When you do that with plants, plants all have a nature, they have a flavor. You know, I'm gonna talk about ginger in a second as an example, but if you do that, you you avoid the possibility of there being um, a side effect or you know a, a negative interaction. But if you just start giving people stuff based on you know this for that, you run into the problem that you can find side effects because you didn't prescribe the material based on its principles. So synergy, combinations, and formulations. We almost always put herbs together in groups put them together and there's synergy that we create. Whether the, you know, in Chinese medicine you actually have a, a four-tiered system where you have a chief herb and the chief herb will generally be the herb that's directed most um, specifically at the disease or the condition that you're diagnosing the person with. You, you, that's the chief herb and it might be the most, you know, present in the formula. Then you have a deputy herb and you have a, an herb that's sort of an assistant to that. You have a minister herb, a minister herb that supports the work of the chief, and you also have a guiding herb, or an herb that kind of reduces toxicities if there are any. So it's, it's the way that we formulate and, com and combine herbs is very important. You know, people got it, uh, in an uproar about ephedra, you know, mahuang, which is this, an incredible plant for us. It's so beneficial when used in a formula where its excitatory effects are balanced and counterbalanced by other plants. But if you start taking ephedra in high doses with potent extracts for weight loss, what do you, you know, it's not ephedra's problem. It's not, that we, it's not the medicine's problem. It's the inappropriate use of the medicine. This is happening with a lot of the cancer-related medicines too. You know, anytime uh, we can take something off the shelf, it seems like the FDA is, and FTC is quick to pull things away if there's any bad press about something. You know, there's lots of examples of it, of how something suddenly gets a, some bad press and then you know, quickly it's taken off the shelves. We can't use it anymore. Uh, it's really unfortunate. It's happening a lot. And, um, you know, we have to stand up for that at some point. There are petitions and things going on out there, but it's not my role to fight that battle. It just affects me directly. So herbal medicine specifically, I want to talk about some of those today. These are the actual 
things, the actual medicines. It's not herbal medicine, it's a thing. It's an individual plant. So let's talk about ginger. Ginger is interesting because it's a food, it's a medicine, it's a supplement, it's a spice. You know, what is it? If you took ginger and you looked at it in the biomedical lens, there's 528, 534, some, you know, compounds that we know that we've identified in ginger. That's, that's a lot of compounds. If I put those compounds up on the wall on a list, would you tell me what, that, oh, that's ginger? Probably not. How do we use that information to help us apply the plant? It's very difficult. So when we apply ginger for nausea, which is really one of my favorite medicines for nausea, especially in cancer, you know, related nausea, appetite suppression. But I'll tell you, just like Don said, you know, when it comes down to the hard cases, vaporized cannabis is the best thing I've ever used. And I've, you know, I've, I've hundreds and hundreds of cancer patients. It's if for appetite, nausea, su you know, appetite suppression, it is the best thing, but not everybody wants to do it. So n ginger becomes one of the things that I use. There's just different causes of why someone has nausea. And if you don't apply it appropriately, you're not going to get the benefit that you wanted to get. So for someone who has a hot stomach, something very hot, like, you know, kind of get, take that, just kind of run with that idea. They've got a lot of hot sensations. They've got an ulcer. It's really, and you give them ginger. Well, ginger is a hot plant. It's probably not going to help them. Probably going to make them worse. So that's why the clinical trials, there's always some people that get help and some people don't because there's no discrimination at the beginning of the trial to say who gets ginger. You just give it to everybody randomly and see if it works. That's not really how to test our medicine. I just put a list of kind of the types of botanical medicines, whole and bulk herbs, low and high potency tinctures. High potency, we have serious potency tinctures out there with things that could kill you with a teaspoon, you know, but that are used in very low doses that are very important herbs for us. Plants like aconite, like gelsimium, like bryonia, like um, um, hyoscyamus niger. They're plants that can be very important for pain, like incredible pain reducers, um, both topically and internally powdered botanical extracts, and then standard, standardized botanically derived compounds. These are becoming a big part of the cancer research program that I'm involved in, which is basically how can we enhance treatments that people are going through? Because, you know, as everybody said here, each person's path with cancer is their own. It's a very individual choice. And it's not necessarily a, a mental process. It's something you feel. And, you, you know, a lot of my patients come to me and they say, I knew this is what I needed to do, or I know this is what I need to do. And so many you know, different stories, they're all, it's all perfect. Everybody's choosing the right path, and there is no right path for everyone. So but when people are going through chemotherapy, there's a lot we can do to help them with plants, a lot we can do to support both making the chemotherapy work more effectively and also reducing the side effects that would limit that drug, especially if it's effective for killing the cancer. Just a little bit on how we're validating things we can standardize extracts now, we can standardize plants, we can get them validated, they can be useful within the biomedical uh, perspective. Here's one herb, Scutellaria barbata, Bonjour Leon, it's, a, it's an herb to clear heat and toxins. A lot of good anti-cancer research. Um, an acupuncturist named Isaac Cohen has done a lot of research on this and teamed up with a company called BioNovo, created something called Beziel. And if you look, Beziel, it's a BZL, Bonjour Leon, they kind of got creative and made it kind of French and sort of cute, you know, Beziel. But it is, it's a standardized extract of the plant. And this one's really cool because it's the whole plant. They're not extracting the individual, comp, you know, compound. A lot of the research these days is done on something that they've taken. They isolate one ingredient from a plant and then research it in, first in vitro, then in animals, you know, and so forth. This is a whole plant. And they've already got this going in 16 U.S. clinical centers, including MD Anderson, many more phase two clinical trials. So this is something to look into, um, especially most of its research is in uh, breast cancer, and it, does, it has a lot of anti-cancer activities. It causes a lot of oxidative can damage to cancer cells, but doesn't harm normal cells. It's just one, uh, you know, one of the options that's out there for us. Um, just getting into cancer, and I want to talk a little bit about kind of when we're thinking about therapies and, and people, like people are saying, there's the issue of being judged for your treatment choices, there's the pressure and the fear. These are really big, big issues and conundrums for people. Um, you know, if we looked at it in the, you know, 10 years ago, someone who just was diagnosed with cancer might have had the first bit of, you know, what was going to be that cancer down the road and whatever that be, it was an emotional trauma that was unresolved. So they couldn't metabolize something in their body. A hormone got shifted. Um, it could have been a toxic exposure. It could have been um, a lifestyle choice. It's hard to say, but you know, each person's unique. And for me, people, 
often are social casualties. They're, they're casualties that we see as a result of the choices of our collective consciousness. They're not individual choices always. I mean, everybody's story is woven and it's a poem and I love finding the meaning in it, but sometimes we're a little too hard on ourselves for our own choices. You know, you look at someone who ate organic food and ran a marathon, you know, all their life and then they get cancer. Well, what, what's, what's going on with that? What's fair about that? It's not always something that, you know, you did wrong. And I always try to work with people on that. And so, 10 years down the road, there's lots of different mechanisms we can see now that are involved in cancer growth and pro progression. One of them recently it's coming up is the, the, the existence of things called telomeres, which are really the, the ends of the chromatin, the genetic material, and we can measure them now. There's a test in Spain that you can send off your, you know, you get a green tube, you send it in to a company in the States, they, f they freeze your white blood cells, send them over to Spain, they analyze your telomere length and they look at how many telomeres that you have that are critically short, okay? Because when telomeres get too short, those cells can't replicate anymore. That's a problem, okay? It's part of the aging process, the reduction of our telomere length. So what they found, though, in research is that people with a certain percentage of short telomeres, critically short telomeres, are 18 times more likely to develop cancer than someone with a more average, normal-length telomere. That's a really profound relationship, 18 times more likely. So there's lots of these areas we can look at, but the thing I'm trying to say is that the process starts a long time before you see the lump. I, t I said before, two millimeter tumor, 10 billion cells that are all dividing. There's a lot we need to do right now before we get the lump, okay? It's really important. And so there's people come to me at all different degrees. They might be five years into that process, and they might be, you know, they don't, they don't have anything, but there's some little things going on. It's kind of like when your car develops a click in the axle, you know, you're like, what's that little click? Ah, oh, it's, no, I'm not gonna worry about it. After a while, it's a little tkunk, tkunk, ah, oh, that darn clunk, I don't really worry about it. And then after a while, it's a pa-ping, pa-ping, and pretty soon you're on the side of the road and your car's broken down. Well, you could have avoided that because when you had that click, you could have gone to see somebody. We could have gone and started working on making some changes in the direction of your life. It's really hard to get people to do that though. You know, people are more willing to normally fix their car than to fix their body, deal with that little, why is my shoulder hurt? That's important, this is important stuff guys. We can do a lot more with this disease in prevention and also the way we live our lives and choose our lifestyles. You know, we, we are making lots of terrible choices as a collective mind about our fuel choices, about our food choices, about our, you know, the way we handle people. They're all leading us to this disease. It's not, you know, there's, it, to me there's no, it's, it, it's just simple. It's a simple metaphor. It's we as you know, as within, so without, as without, so within. It's happening, and cancer is rising and rising as our primary disease. I think heart disease is up there too, and you know, you could think about just not having a lot of heart in some of our actions as a whole. But my point being that cancer gains momentum at different degrees depending on how developed it is. So when you have a tumor that's say you know six centimeters. And depending on, you know, another thing to say is that every single cancer is different. Everyone is unique. And even a cancer from one part of that cancer, cell, that tumor to another part, completely different. Which is why there's so many problems right now. We're trying to, you know, do the best we can to test tumors genetically. You know, go inside, get biopsies of the tumor in a person who has an aggressive disease that's spreading. We need to get a, a, a therapy that works, that's gonna target that cancer. But you can find that just millimeters away, the heterogeneous cell population shows that the genes are totally different. It's very hard to find a therapy that gets, hits all those cancer cells. Now, some cancer cells are less undifferentiated than others, some, some tumors. Some tumors are more homogenous. They're a little bit easier to treat if you get the right, you know, the right treatment in place. Point being that sometimes people come to me and they want me to treat them with herbs. And it's really hard to treat things with herbs when they have a lot of momentum. It's kind of like putting a, you know, kind of like putting a piece of leather between a sledgehammer and a, and a stake, you know. You can probably do a little bit of softening for a minute, but there's, there's a process in place. And so some people are all willing to take on huge lifestyle changes and go, you know, go to, you know, they can do all kinds of things. There's Holda Clark and there's Gerson and there's Brzezinski and there's all these different great things. But from Dr. McKee's look, we're, we're looking at about a 10% survival, you know, long-term cure in stage four cancer cases from any of these, okay? That's the reality. So be sure you're not just jumping on some bandwagon. Sit with yourself, get clear about what's the best path for, path for you, and we can be scholars together, all of us, and find the best 
solution for your particular situation, your body and your cancer, because it's unique to you. And be careful with momentum, because the bigger the disease is, the faster it's growing. It has more and more power, and it's harder and harder to treat with subtler methods. So sometimes we need a bigger weapon you know, to use, and it has to be that in certain cases. I've lost a lot of really beautiful and powerful people because they, they were emotionally okay with their own death. They had come to terms with the fact that they were, I, I know I'm okay to die. Okay, well that's okay. But do you want to live? That's another question. Okay, they're two different things altogether. I've got a lot of people, I've, got, I've treated Buddhist monks, lamas, and a lot of them, you know, it doesn't matter. Even if your soul is pure, you're still here with a physical body that's tied to this whole physical reality that we're creating together. And even though you've emotionally cleared yourself, it doesn't mean that that big growing cancer is going to go away. I'd love to say that it does. And you might be that small percentage of person who it does. This magic can happen. But I'm just saying, I'm not going to bet on it myself. And if you're my mom, we're going to get down to this thing and we're going to do everything we can because I want you to be around because I love you. Unless, you know, you're suffering and then that's another case. There's, it's always each case specific. But my point being, again, just like... It's, it's got to be very individualized. Everybody's got their own path to live, and there's a lot we can do. So that was a little bit of a divergence, but I think it's important. So chemotherapy, we can do a lot with side effects, just kind of like some examples of what we see. Um, hormone therapies, something called qi and blood deficiency in Chinese medicine. We see this a lot. You know, people start to get anemia. They, you know, you've got iron deficiency. You've got red blood cell deficiency. White blood cell counts are going down. Some people can't keep taking their chemo because their counts are too low. They get injections of what are called colony stimulating factors to try and make their bone marrow produce more cells that will then go out and supply the body with these you know, white and red blood cells. Don't like those drugs so much. There are other ways of doing it. This formula, Angelica decoction to build the blood, Dongwe Bu Shui Tong. It's a great formula. You should know about it. It's just two herbs, Angelica and Astragalus. The ratio was discovered by Li Dong Yuan in 1247 AD. He, I don't know how many generations he was a doctor. You know, he could have been 30 generations. I don't know. But he found that it had to be five to one. He said the ratio of the two herbs, astragalus to Dongwe to Angelica, has to be five to one. They have to be boiled together in the traditional method in order to give the effects, which is increasing the production of red and white blood cells in the bone marrow, also platelets, also generating what we call chi in blood. What's interesting is that if you, you know, the, in the research that was done, and you can see that the, these are some of the effects that were shown, you know, increasing erythropoietin, which is a, a hormone that's released to induce the growth of erythrocytes, which is red blood cells, that level increases. Um, you can see that you, you induce the growth of platelets, so the, the, the creation you know, from stem cells into our formed elements in the blood. Lots of amazing things have been done with this, lots of studies, lots of in vitro studies, lots of animal studies, and it has an 800-year history. So it's, th this, this has a lot of evidence for me. One of the things that's interesting in the study that, the, that I first I learned about this formula kind of in the scientific realm was that they did a study where they took the 5 to 1 ratio, yeah, we've got five minutes. I think we'll, we'll, do, we'll just keep going until 10 minutes because I've got more to say. So, so you take the five to one ratio and you cook them together and you get this incredible increase in the output of erythrocytes in animals. Okay. Well, they did the same thing. They took the same amount of material, but they did it in a one to one ratio. Okay. Stragglers to Angelica. You want to know what happened? 5% of the increase in erythrocytes than when they got the five to one extract. So follow the path through the forest, folks. We know a lot. We already know a lot. I love this little slide. You know, we don't know how our ancestor could make up such a formulation, but nevertheless, one should follow the ancient wisdom before we could fully reveal a mystery. And here's the formula, so you can have it. And big doses of astragalus, really big. And I've got, I, I can, you know, I've got inf information if you want, you know, on how to use any of the things I talk about. Um, you can contact my clinic, Jade Mountain Medicine. We've got all kinds of handouts and things that are, I just love giving information to people. So it's funny, I hear people's stories. I'm like, oh my God, I'd love to tell that person about this, you know. And I have a lot of information about drugs too and, and which ones are working combinations and so forth. So uh, open for questions as well. 
this is something that's interesting. From astragalus, there's an A-glycone. There's the, and astragalus is, has a group of compounds called astragalusides. One of them, A-glycone, um, has been called TA65. And this is this this compound has been shown to increase the length of telomeres. Okay, and people are doing a lot of testing with this, where they're testing their telomeres, getting on this TA65, and then retesting, um, and pretty amazing results. I just wanted to throw it up there for you. And it gets back to you know giving someone 120 grams of astragalus a day. Well, they're going to get a bit of this astragaluside in there, and they're, you're going to be inducing this telomere growth, protecting their telomeres. And cancer cells already have super short telomeres, and they're not affected by this. They actually have overcome that. So if you don't know about turmeric and curcumin, this is one of the most researched cancer compounds in, on the planet right now. MD Anderson has 1,000 patients taking this in combination with chemotherapies, especially 5-FU, platinum drugs, Gemzar. It has huge you know, in vitro and animal data, and now gathering clinical data on its ability to reduce inflammation, induce hundreds, literally hundreds of cancer-related pathways, you know, modulating those pathways in a positive way, and helping chemotherapies be effective. I'm not going to go too much into it, but this is one slide that shows the pathways that were known in 2008 from Bharat Agarwal. What we know curcumin affects positively involved with cancer. This is one plant, you guys. This is one part of one plant, okay? Research on curcumin, just so you can see that you know we're coming from a place of lots of research. Scutellaria, another plant from Chinese medicine that has you know incredible benefit. Tons of research. All you know again, this is an herb that in Chinese medicine is used to clear heat and dry dampness. And these are pathological factors that we identify in the body by looking at the tongue, the pulse, the intake, and we can apply these to reduce th those pathological factors. We, saw, we see that in people who we measure things in, they also have upregulated lev up levels of inflammatory compounds like cyclooxygenase 2, nuclear factor kappa beta, et cetera. And so it has multiple, multiple targets that it affects and very powerful influence on cancer and then also reducing some of the problems that we're having with chemotherapies being effective. So it has synergy with chemotherapy and I want to get to some of that. This plant, the tiger, this is the tiger cane or the, the Japanese knotweed. This is the source of the, the compound resveratrol that keeps being talked about a lot as an anti-cancer compound, as a synergist in cancer. Um, this is another herb that clears toxins from the body in Chinese medicine, moves the blood, it clears heat, drains dampness, and it transforms phlegm, okay? All of those pathological factors get involved in a tumorigenesis process. In, in, in Western medicine now, we see that there's all kinds of pathways. These are genes that suppress tumors, inflammatory pathways, growth factors, things that resveratrol does to help the body when in the case of cancer. So using resveratrol as a synergist is very well documented, and now we have lots of clinical data on that as well. Here's the molecule, normalizing gene expression. Uh, a great one, too, in, in diabetes and obesity. You know, actually, it was a, it was a big study with resveratrol was that there was a group of mice that was fed um, a very fat-rich and sugar-rich, carbohydrate-rich diet, and they, they all became obese, and they were given resveratrol daily. And another group of mice were given the standard rat-mouse feed. They measured the lifespan on both groups, and the groups that got obese stayed obese on the resveratrol, but they lived longer than the mice who just ate the regular rat feed. It's a great study. It's very interesting. Um, and there was a whole thing about wine because resveratrol was first identified in wine. It's actually in the grape seed and skin. So people were saying, oh, great, drink wine. But, you know, there's only a little bit of it and there's some other stuff in wine too, so be careful. Um, Herb-drug interactions. This is from one of my dear friends, Jonathan Treasure. Herb-drug interactions is what we do. We do it every day. It's don't be afraid of it. It's not a bad thing. It's actually really good. And there's only a couple of clearly defined negative interactions with herbs and drugs. Very few, only a couple. And I can give you those uh, directly. And Jonathan Treasure and Dwight McKee have produced a book. Um, the second edition is on its way out right now, and it's called Herb, Nutrient, and Drug Interactions. It is the treatise on the, the subject right now. It's 900 pages. It's pretty much everything we have, everything we know right now. Most of it's in vitro and animal research, but you know everything is in there, everything we have. Mostly synergy, okay? One more formula. This is called PHY906. That's what they're calling it at Yale, but it's actually a formula called Huang Chin Tong. Huang Chin was that herb I showed you, Scutellaria. So this is Scutellaria decoction, okay? It's just four herbs. Scutellaria, 
white peony, licorice, and zisyphus. Okay, there's just four herbs. And it's being studied now at Yale. They've gone through several clinical trials, and this is the first formula that's actually shown clear patient benefits through clinical trials. Okay, know about this formula because at least, you know, if you want to use herbs and you have cancer and you're doing chemo and your doctor says, well, we don't know anything about them, we know something. At least now we can say we know something. This is, this is actually a lame version of what we could actually do for somebody if we gave them a formula that was directed at their condition and all the specifics of their constitution and their situation. But at least we can say, hey, we're going to use a version of this formula and it's been tested in clinical trials and it's benefited patients both in reducing their side effects and enhancing the chemotherapy. I'm sure my time is up. Um, some research. You guys look, look at the information you have, just some ways that plants affect pathways. And I'm just going to say something about types of data. The in vitro studies lead to the animal studies. The animal studies lead to the human trials. And the human trials is really all that the oncologists are going to, you know, give any weight to. But remember, things move through this and things started out in that traditional medicine. So for me, evidence-based medicine is traditional usage, modern research, and clinical experience all together, okay? whole medicine, look at everything, all the information we can. I use tons of lab work, I examine labs, I examine the person. And real quick, I love this, if you're looking at chronic disease, first slow the progression, then stabilize the disease, and then pop, you know, if you're gonna find a managed care or a cure, it's gonna come down the road, but these things don't happen quickly, it's not like taking aspirin for a headache. Quality of life. Thank you all so much for your time.